go to the cloud. So hello everyone. So welcome to our this week efficient AI seminar talk. And today, very glad we have the Dr. Igor Federal from the ARM machine learning research team. They give us a talk on the tiny model design on the MCU. So Igor is currently a staff research engineer in the ARM machine learning research group. His research focuses on neural network search and conditioning in the context of the resource constraint hardware. So he received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of California, San Diego. So now let's welcome Igor to give us a wonderful talk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so the, the title of the talk is Tiny Model Design. Um, and uh, uh, I'm from the ARM Machine Learning Research Lab. We do a lot of work in this kind of uh, tiny ML space uh, and in general in um, sort of uh, conditioning neural networks uh, for, uh, for very resource constrained hardware. So if you, uh, if these ideas are uh, interesting to you and you want to chat more, I have my email here. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and also, I've linked here to the to our website where we we post um, blogs and and uh, research papers. Um, yeah, so let's begin. Um, so the 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 primary motivation behind uh, designing tiny models is that uh, we're working with tiny hardware. Uh, and the reason that we're interested in tiny hardware is because there is a, a vast abundance of tiny hardware in the world. So if we just look at the number of uh, chips, uh, MCU chips shipped in, uh, in, the, in the recent past compared to the number of GPUs, it's like two orders of magnitude more MCUs, uh, uh, microcontroller units that, that have shipped. So that, that means there's a lot more of these uh, very small, uh, hardware is out there in the world. And part of the reason that they're more popular is that they're a lot less expensive. So if you look at just the cost, um, so like a Arduino Uno, which is like a, a breakout board uh, uh, with an MCU, costs about a dollar compared to a GPU, which is $700. Uh, and so a lot more sort of applications uh, can use the, uh, these uh, MCUs, whereas only a very limited number of applications could use GPUs. Uh, and in addition, they also draw a lot less power, um, so they can run a, on a battery. Um, and there's lots of other advantages. So uh, the, the computation can be done locally, uh, which saves a lot of energy. And the reason is that the, the transmission of data across the network actually occupies a lot of, uh, or requires a lot of energy. Uh, in addition, if you're not communicating uh, with some server, then you also have the uh, reduced latency because you don't have to spend time basically sending and receiving data. Um, and in addition, since you're not sending data anywhere, then you, you're preserving the, the data privacy. Uh, and another benefit of the, the small hardware is that um, they can go into uh, small form factor products. So here I have an example of uh, uh, a hearphone product from Bose, which was the first FDA approved self-fitting air conduction hearing aid. And um, the basic idea is that it sort of uh, enhances audio uh, for people. Um, clinical findings demonstrated that performance benefit was consistent with that of the same hearing aid fitted by hearing professionals. Uh, and this kind of uh, product uh, used a kind of a basic denoising algorithm called beamforming. Um, but at the same time, there's growing interest in, in, in taking something like this and uh, employing a neural network approach to do the denoising uh, uh, in, the, in the hear phone. And the reason that uh, there's interest in that is because the neural network approach uh, exhibits superior denoising performance. It requires only one microphone, and it doesn't require tuning of the beam position by the user. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to discuss more about this uh, later on in the talk. Right, so um, we've discussed why we care about uh, the, the tiny hardware. 
Now, what's the, the main uh, challenge in, in actually designing models uh, for this kind of hardware? Um, so the really prohibitive kind of um, uh, thing is the memory. So if we take a, a really simple example, the Linet convolutional neural network for MNIST, this is a four layer um, model, it's, it's very simple. And if we just look at how much uh, storage space is required to store uh, the, the network and how much, how much RAM is required to actually store the intermediate activations produced by the network, then we see that uh, both of these, uh, the flash and the RAM usage violates uh, the constraints of something like the Arduino Uno, which only has two kilobytes of RAM. So really the, the problem is, is one, of, uh, of, one of storing the, the neural network and of storing the intermediate activations. And up until uh, several years ago, it was actually believed that you, you, couldn't, you couldn't run a neural network uh, on a device like, like uh, Arduino Uno. And so you, uh, you should sort of like switch to some other classical kind of algorithm, like a decision tree or a nearest neighbor approach. So here I have some codes from papers from that time, time frame where basically uh, people were uh, kind of abandoning neural networks uh, uh, and, and looking more into other approaches. So the, the approach that uh, we've taken in our research is that uh, while, while existing neural networks may have this problem with, with, uh, with memory, uh, you can actually use um, algorithms to, to automatically design models that you could deploy onto memory constrained hardware. And so basically in this talk, I'm going to go over three of our uh, research works <clears throat> in this topic. Um, and I, and I, and I, and I uh, included the citations here in case you want to uh, go and re read these in more detail. But I'm gonna start with uh, the, the, the first paper where we use an algorithm uh, basically to traverse a space of neural networks and to find models that you could deploy onto uh, an MCU, even with as little as two kilobytes of RAM. In the second work, uh, we showed that efficient pruning of neural networks produces high quality, low latency speech denoising, uh, which is of interest to something like the Hearphone product that, that, we, uh, that we looked at uh, in the previous slides. And then in the last paper, uh, I'm going to discuss how we use differentiable architecture search uh, to do a fast hardware aware model search. Now, please uh, stop me if, uh, if something doesn't make sense. Okay, so let's let's jump into uh, to this to this work. Uh, the title was uh, sparse sparse architecture search for CNNs on resource constrained microcontrollers. Uh, the high level idea is that um, we want to maximize the the accuracy of the model while minimizing the model size and the working memory. And the working memory is sort of at a high level just the amount of memory or RAM needed to store the intermediate feature maps uh, in order to do the inference with the model. Um, so just to introduce some notation, uh, we let capital uh, omega and lowercase omega denote a point in a design space and the model parameters that correspond to that design space. So for example, capital omega could be like uh, the architecture of the network, like the number of layers, which, which uh, operators are used at each layer, uh, and so on, whereas lowercase omega are the actual weights for, for that architecture. And so we define uh, three functions that we're interested in minimizing. F1 uh, is uh, basically just uh, the, the uh, test error or the validation error. So we're looking for uh, very accurate models. F2 it just measures the size, the model size. So we want to, we want to minimize the, the size of the models that we find. And F3 is the, uh, is the working memory for the network. And this, this you can see is a, is a maximization. Uh, it's a maximum over all the layers of the network, where for each layer, we measure the, the amount of working memory required to uh, actually process that layer. And so by taking the maximum, we, we kind of get the, the uh, um, maximum RAM usage for the model. Um, <clears throat> in order to actually uh, 
do the search, we use the closed form expression for uh, F2 and F3. So for model size, we just looked at the L0 norm of the weights. And for working memory, we, we looked at the sum of the L0 norm of the input of the layer with the output of the layer, which is, uh, if you look at deployment tools, this is, this is kind of how they allocate memory. So this is um, pretty actually close to reality. Uh, now, in order to actually minimize those three objectives, we use something called neural architecture search. And the high level idea of neural architecture search is shown in this diagram. So you start by defining a search space uh, that you want to explore. And that search space is traversed by a search strategy, which uh, basically proposes uh, points in, in, a, in a space to evaluate uh, and sends that to the, uh, to the performance estimation strategy block, which then evaluates that, uh, that point from the, from the search space, feeds it back to the search strategy, and then this kind of continues in a loop until um, you know, the user stops the search. So in our case, what we considered in this work for the search space uh, was the architecture of the neural network that included things like the number of layers, the layer width or the number of channels in each layer, the connectivity, uh, meaning like does, uh, um, does this layer have a residual connection around it, the layer types, uh, which refers to things like the, the kinds of convolutions, let's say used, so com regular convolution versus depthwise separable. We searched over the, the input resolution, uh, like the, so basically downsampling the, uh, the input images, which has a, a large effect on the working memory actually, because a lot of times the input images are so large that just the input violates the working memory constraint, uh, as well as the, the pooling size. And that's again, basically controlling the resolution in, a, in, in the intermediate uh, layers of the neural network. So the search space includes the, those architectural parameters, but also uh, for each architecture, we uh, pruned the architecture, meaning that we threw away uh, some of the connections. Um, and I'm not going to go sort of into the, the details of pruning. Uh, I think it's a, it's a uh, pretty well explored uh, space. So I, I, don't, I don't wanna go too much into the details, but basically the idea is you, you start with a model and then you can throw away some of the connections, uh, some of the feature maps without hurting the accuracy. Um, but typically these algorithms require uh, the user to choose, let's say what percentage of each layer to throw away. So that's a hyperparameter that has to be tuned. And so we, we included those hyperparameters in, in the search space itself. And finally, we included the training hyperparameters in the search space, which is like learning rate, uh, weight decay, uh, things like that. Um, so the, the big challenges that, that we were uh, trying to solve uh, with this is that at its core, this is a multi-objective optimization problem. We're trying to minimize three objectives simultaneously. Um, and we're trying to do the optimization over a, a search space, which has lots of different variables. Some of them are related to each other in a hierarchical kind of way, meaning that, uh, for example, the number of layers in the neural network uh, sort of um, impacts you know, which, which of the other parameters are important. So for example, uh, if, we, uh, if we say that uh, one of the points or one of the elements in the search space represents the number of layers. So let's say that that is, uh, let's say uh, three layers, uh, then the, uh, the, the type of, let's say, uh, layer four doesn't matter anymore, right? So, so some, some of the elements sort of control whether or not we care about other elements. Um, and and the, the really the big thing with all of these is the training cost. So the, 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 um, each, each neural network sort of has to be evaluated, meaning it has to be trained. And so um, you know, th this can, can be prohibitive in terms of the search cost. So this is a sort of a, um, a diagram uh, of, of how, we, how we went about solving this. Uh, and so basically I'll just walk, walk you through each of the blocks. So in the middle, there's a job scheduling block. This basically 
is a is a queue that has uh, configurations that that we wanted to test, and this queue interacts with workers, which can be parallelized, that uh, evaluate uh, each of the configurations. And within each worker, basically the 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 worker takes the configuration, converts it into a neural network, which it trains and prunes, and then it throws that to an evaluation block. So the evaluation block. Uh, can do uh, quite a number of things. In our case, uh, in this picture, I'm showing the evaluation block just measuring the accuracy of the model and the number of parameters. But it can do any number of things. For example, it could even send this configuration to a, a hardware to measure the, the latency on the hardware. So it can be totally black box. Uh, now, this, this, uh, these evaluated um, neural networks, along with, with their characteristics, are stored in these buckets. Uh, and we take these buckets and we basically build a non-parametric function. So uh, for each for each of the each of the buckets. So we model the accuracy as a function of the configuration and the number of parameters as a function of the configuration. Uh, and then we use that within within an optimizer to basically uh, suggest new jobs or sorry new configurations to send to the job scheduler. And I'm going to go into the details of uh, each of these uh, sections. Um, so starting out with, with the multi-objective optimizer, we worked with something called random scalarization. So remember that the, the objective of this uh, entire process is to find the, the Pareto frontier for a set of functions, uh, let's say uh, capital K functions. And the idea of a scalarization is basically to convert this multi-objective optimization problem into a, a, a one objective optimization problem. Uh, and this is done through this uh, idea of a Chebyshev scalarization, where we take the maximum uh, of, the, of the functions uh, multiplied by, by a scalar's lambda k. And the scalars basically uh, let us control um, which functions we care we care about exploring, and which regions of the of the function space we care about exploring. Uh, so basically, by by choosing the support of the lambdas, we can bias our search to to various uh, regions regions of f, and this is uh, useful for for this kind of search because in our case we actually know sort of the region that we care about, right? We care about models which you know let's say have at least 95% accuracy, which have you know, less than two kilobytes uh, of flash and uh, less than two kilobytes of SRAM usage. Uh, and so in this, in this bottom, bottom uh, right uh, uh, figure here, I'm showing that you can specify preferences uh, over which, which regions of the function space to explore. Um, right. And uh, Let's see, in, 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 the, in the top right figure, I'm showing a comparison between this kind of multi-objective optimization where we're doing this kind of random scalarization versus a more traditional kind of scalarization, which is used in, in the architecture search literature where you simply multiply the objectives together. And you see that uh, when you do this kind of product scalarization, you only end up exploring little parts of the frontier Whereas with the random scalarization, you explore the entire frontier. Uh, are there any questions on this? No, no questions. Okay. Um, right. So, so this this is sort of how we deal with the multiple objectives. Uh, but remember that we, we still don't really know the functional form of the objectives, right? We don't know the accuracy of, of a configuration as a function of the configuration itself. And so here is where we use a Bayesian model. Uh, and for the Bayesian model, we use a Gaussian process. So uh, a, a Gaussian process is just basically where you take a collection of, of points and uh, you treat their joint PDF as a, as a Gaussian. Uh, and the reason you do that is because then you can evaluate the, the posterior enclosed form, 
So you can get uh, the distribution of the function at each point in the space uh, conditioned on your previous observations. Um, the only thing that you have to specify as a user is this, uh, this kernel function, uh, kappa, which basically is like a distance measure between uh, different configuration points, xi and xj. And that, that's actually uh, important for us because this is where uh, this is where this is where the 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 sort of the details of the search space come in, uh, because the way that we measure distance is actually is important when when the variables have these kinds of complex relationships. So remember that we have uh, different kinds of variables that we're optimizing over. We have categorical variables, so it's like the the kind of convolution that we're using at each layer. Um, we also have uh, integer valued. Uh, random variables, or sorry, uh, their optimization variables, like the, the kernel size uh, for a layer. So are we doing a three by three, a four by four, et cetera? Um, we have real valued variables like learning rate. And then we have the hierarchical kind of relationships where um, the kernel size of the third layer uh, doesn't matter if the configuration is only a two layer network. And so basically we want to, we want to handle all of these kinds of uh, considerations uh, by, by defining the kernel appropriately. Um, so for, for categorical variables, the way you measure distance between configurations uh, is by basically uh, assigning the same exact distance, um, the same exact distance between elements that aren't, that aren't the same. So meaning that the distance between, uh, let's say, uh, a regular convolution and a depth-wise separable convolution is the same as the distance between a regular convolution and a, and a grouped convolution, something like that. Um, so for, for, for integer valued or quantized variables, the, the, the point is just to make sure that you, you're measuring distance between the, the, uh, the, actual, the actual rounded values of the variables. Uh, be, because when you're doing the, this kind of optimization, there's sort of no guarantee that, that the, the um, optimizer will will uh, predict the, the variables to be integers. So you need to make sure that you quantize before you evaluate the distance. And then to deal with the hierarchical uh, kind of um, considerations, you basically have to project the data into a space where um, for the points with the same number of relevant parameters, you ignore the irrelevant parameters. So let's say you're comparing one configuration that's a, a three-layer model to another configuration that's a, a three-layer model, you just ignore all the parameters for layers four and on. Um, and if you have configurations with different numbers of relevant parameters, so you're comparing, let's say, a three-layer network with a four-layer network, you just look at the, the jointly um, relevant uh, parameters. And this can be done by, by, by this kind of projection. Um, right, so that's that's kind of how we we uh, we do the, the, the optimization, and then lastly, uh, in order to speed up the search, we we do something called a morphism. So, uh, in our in our search, we 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 combine completely randomly chosen architectures with architectures chosen by the optimizer, and the architectures chosen by the optimizer are chosen according to the approach I described previously with the one caveat that all proposals uh, are constrained to be sort of close, so to speak, to previously trained configurations. And the reason that we, that we uh, require this is because then new proposals can inherit the, the things we learned from the, from the old uh, already trained proposals. So in our case, the new proposals will inherit the weights and the pruning masks from previously trained proposals. And this allows you to, to reduce the, the training time by two to eight X, depending on the data set size. Uh, and the idea is kind of similar to uh, this uh, Lamarckian uh, evolution idea that's uh, kind of, um, it's an old idea about how evolution worked where giraffes keep getting, keep getting taller basically by, by stretching. Okay, so um, here are some results. So here I'm comparing uh, the algorithm that, that we proposed with the state-of-the-art approaches from, uh, from when this paper was published, uh, most of which at the time were 
uh, non-neural network based approaches and included things like decision trees and, and, um, uh, and nearest neighbors. Uh, but there is one approach here that, that, that was uh, neural network based called uh, memory optimal direct convolution. Um, in this set of experiments, we, we were only optimizing for the, for the accuracy and the number of parameters. So F1 and F2. And we were using random pruning uh, to, to basically throw away as many, as many uh, model parameters as possible. And we see that in all, all cases across all four of these data sets, uh, we, have, uh, we have found prey to optimal neural networks, uh, which, which have less parameters and higher accuracy than the methods we compare with. And then uh, this is just another way of looking uh, at, at those pictures. Basically, uh, this is showing uh, for each, for each uh, algorithm and for each data set, uh, I, I list the, the, the network found by, by the, the existing algorithm. So for example, the top left corner is uh, on the MNIST data set. Uh, the Banzai decision tree algorithm finds a network with 97% uh, accuracy. Uh, and uh, what is that? Um, 2000 uh, parameters, uh, whereas uh, our, our approach finds a model with 500 parameters and 97.2% uh, accuracy. So in all cases, we find networks that have less parameters and are more accurate. Uh, and the, uh, the other interesting thing to look at here is the uh, number of GPU days that we, we spent to actually find the models. So you see that it's actually quite high. So even on data sets like MNIST, we spent you know, somewhere in the order of 10 GPU days um, to, find, to find these uh, Pareto optimal models. So um, here I'm showing the experiments we did to target uh, actual deployment. So we were, we were now optimizing for accuracy, model size, and working memory. And we, we were instead, instead of using uh, random pruning, we were using channel pruning. Um, and here again, I'm showing that uh, we find models which, which are smaller, uh, more accurate, and have less working memory than, than the, the Banzai decision tree approach was the state of the art at the time. Uh, and in, in this uh, table at the bottom, I'm showing that we actually deployed these models uh, on, on, the, on the micro bit. Uh, and we measured the, the latency and, and the energy that, uh, that they drew. Okay, uh, now uh, for some interesting ablation results. So one of the things that we were curious about was how much does the pruning aspect of this whole thing matter? What if we just did the search without pruning? And uh, what, what we found is that the, 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 the models that we find with pruning are way more accurate and way smaller than, than, ones, than ones you would find if you, if you just excluded pruning from the search. Uh, which is quite interesting and, and, and kind of speaks to the power of pruning. Um, and then in, 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 this, in this bottom table, we were, uh, we were studying the sort of the, the benefits that you get from, from the, the components. So how much does a product scalarization, for example, um, help you in, in doing the search? And, and what we found here is if you, if you actually limit yourself to a 250 configuration budget, meaning that you only, you only um, evaluate a maximum of 250 configurations, then uh, the, this algorithm without product scalarization fails to find a reasonable model which satisfies the, the constraints of two kilobyte uh, model size and two kilobyte working memory. Um, and, then, and then the last column shows that if you don't do this kind of morphism idea, basically where uh, if you don't do morphism, you retrain every single configuration from scratch. You end up actually finding more accurate models faster, but it costs you more in GPU days. Uh, and so, so you, kind of, you kind of pay for that. Okay, uh, that's, that's the, the end of the, this, this first paper. So before I move on, are there any questions about, about this work? Yes, so, so, so actually I have one question, but um, maybe I can wait till the end of your talk and ask them together. Is that okay? Or you want to answer them during your talk? Uh, 
Yeah, I think during during is good. Yeah. So, so I have a question about the Gaussian process part. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Let me. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, so we know that the Gaussian process is a very elegant uh, Bayesian method. Mm -hmm. and, but when we apply this method to the to the NIS, so I have one question intuitively. So so because the, for the Gaussian process, it's involved with the, the matrix inversion. And um, especially for the very large scale Gaussian process in many scientific computing. So the, how to accelerate the large scale Gaussian process is a very important topic. So now, so when we apply this to the neural work, we know that, so the number of parameters, the, the entire search phase is, uh, search space is also very huge. So in that case, whether the Gaussian process will become the speed bottleneck here? Um, so in, in our case, the, the, size of, the size of the space is like the number of hyperparameters. So it's, it's not that big, you know, it could be like a hundred at most, right? Um, oh, okay. Okay. So because you use, you use the Gaussian process just for the hyperparameter. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Then but even, even if it was, even if it was the, let's, let's say it was like hundreds, hundred thousand hyperparameters, it would be hard to invert the matrix because you have like the K inverse there, but you don't, you only have to do that once, right? Because one, once you have that, you can store it and then you just need to use it in order to evaluate the posterior at your your candidates uh, in, in your configuration space. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Is there uh, any other questions? Um, um, actually, one quick question, um, Igor. So um, the, 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 one quick question is like the recurrence. Did you have recurrence also a possibility in your search space? Another question is, I know like you were really focused on like a, a microcontroller um, our limited architectures here, but did you see any um, similarity or resemblance between the models that you found to known commonly used models, uh, which are much larger, but just in terms of architectural similarity? Mm, okay, good, good question. So we did not consider recurrence um, in this set of experiments. And although the, the, the second paper will cover exactly uh, recurrent architectures. So the, I think that the reason we didn't consider recurrence here is because we were looking at um, image data sets. Right. And so there is recurrence is not really that, um, that interesting. Uh, that's number one. Number two, um, we, we were interested in deploying these to, to a microcontroller to show basically that you could deploy a neural network. And the, the deployment tool we were using, it was called um, MicroTensor, didn't um, support recurrent architectures. So uh, that was not a consideration. I see. And uh, let's see, your other question was about, do these models share um, characteristics with known like architectures, right? Right. So, um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, in general, these are kind of fairly simple models. They're like um, several convolutional layers followed by several fully connected layers. Mm -hmm. So they're not, it's not that complicated. The, I think the, the real kind of um, uh, benefit comes from the pruning because we, we prune these models really heavily. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, do, doing, the, doing like choosing the number of um, the number of layers and the width of each layer and then, and then the pruning hyperparameters jointly, I think that's, that's the real kind of um, interesting part of, about this. I wouldn't say the architecture itself was that interesting. I see. Thank you. Um, any, any other questions? Okay. I will move on to the next part of the talk. And uh, so this, in this talk, I'm going to discuss our work called Tiny LSTMs, Efficient Neural Speech Enhancement for Hearing Aids. So this is, you can imagine this is kind of targeting um, uh, the, the sort of earphones product that, that I introduced before. Um, and this actually was a work that we did in collaboration with Bose. So 
uh, the, the, the general idea is basically that you want to be able to run a, a neural network-based denoiser uh, on an MCU. And so if you're going to do that, you have a, a list of kind of specifications that your, that your model has to meet. Um, so I'll just run through them. The, the, one of the biggest ones is the, the, the model complexity, uh, which we measure in the number of operations per inference. So we have an upper bound basically on the number of operations we can do to generate an output. And this, the, this comes from the fact that uh, we want to have a very low latency denoiser. The idea is as a sound comes in, you don't want the output, the denoised output, the, the, the clean output to, to be delayed so much that a person would notice basically like a, like a lag uh, between, between someone saying something and, and you actually hearing what they said. Uh, and so we, we were looking for a 10 millisecond compute budget, meaning it takes at most 10 milliseconds to compute the output given the input. Um, and then in order to actually run it on MCU, we, uh, as before, we, we have a constraint on the model size, which has to be less than 0.5 megabytes, uh, as well as the intermediate um, the feature maps, they have to sit in 320 kilobytes of RAM. Um, and also we wanted to use a low power operation. So we wanted to use, a, we wanted the data type to be integer uh, to, uh, for the whole model. And finally, uh, while we're doing all these uh, sort of compressions and, and making sure that the model is fast and small, uh, we don't want to sacrifice on performance. So the, the, the perceptual quality should be good. Um, and, and that's actually, uh, uh, as, as measured by, by, by subjective users. So uh, that's, that, that was one interesting part of this, that uh, what, what we did here, we actually evaluated uh, by, by playing the, the, the denoised output produced by, by our compressed algorithm to users and asking them sort of to, to tell us how, uh, how it sounded. Um, so the, the, this is a high level diagram of how the, de, the denoising um, neural network works. So the, the input comes in, in the time domain. Uh, the input is some signal X that we care about, like speech, let's say, uh, with some additive noise N. And the idea is basically we wanna get rid of the noise. So the first thing uh, that's done is the, this, this, uh, this input signal, it's in a time domain that's converted into the frequency domain using a short time Fourier transform. Um, and then uh, the, only the magnitude of that, of that frequency domain representation is fed to the denoising algorithm. Uh, and the denoising algorithm basically produces a mask that's a zero or one. And that mask uh, is multiplied element wise with the, the magnitude of the noisy uh, spectrogram uh, to produce to produce the the estimate of of the clean speech, and for the phase we just use the phase of the of the noisy signal, um, and then the the actual structure of the neural network which produces the mask is a uh, is two LSTMs uh, followed by two FC layers. Okay, so um, given this, uh, so our, our goal is now to to sort of make sure that this this denoiser. Um, is fast and, and, and can actually fit on, on an MCU. And uh, for this, we were inspired by this work on um, pruning LSTMs. And the idea is uh, sort of to prune, uh, to throw away as many of the hidden states as possible. So the LSTM works by uh, having uh, some, some memory, H, uh, which is uh, combined with an input X to produce uh, the output as, as long as the next uh, hidden state H. And so if you uh, basically, if you, have, if you have less elements in H, you have less things to compute, less things to store. Um, so, right, so it's, uh, yes, right. So the, the key question becomes how many states of, of H do you throw away? Or how many neurons do you prune? Um, the lesson we, we learned from the previous uh, work from Sparse is that if you do this in a completely black box approach, 
then, uh, then you're required to sort of retrain every new candidate and it's very slow. And in this application, it takes 14 GPU hours to train a single candidate. So if we have to evaluate hundreds of them, it's just, it's just going to be prohibited. So our key insight was that we converted a combinatorial problem, basically the problem of how many things to throw away at each layer into a continuous one. And then we solved that problem with gradient descent. Okay, so how did we do that? So we start out by grouping the weights of the LSTM uh, by which element of the hidden state they, they map to. Um, and then for each, each group, we assign a, a mask, a binary mask, zero or one. Uh, and this mask is one if the L2 norm of the weights in that group is more than some, uh, some threshold tau and zero otherwise. And uh, basically then we, we uh, augment the regular training objective uh, over, over the parameters of, the, of this neural network uh, theta uh, with, with a regularization term, which promotes uh, some, of these, some of these binary mass variables to be zero. Okay. Uh, and the, this lambda hyperparameter basically controls you know, the, how many of the groups will be set to zero. Um, and we, we, then we basically plug this into TensorFlow and solve it using uh, backpropagation uh, with a, you know, an SGD optimizer atom or something. And the, the key kind of um, challenge is how do you backpropagate through this indicator function, through this binary, uh, through this binary mask R? And we used a simple approach where uh, in the forward pass, we use the, the binary uh, version of R. But in the backward pass, in order to generate gradients, we replace that with a sigmoid. Okay, so that's how we basically pruned uh, this, these LSTM and FC layers. Uh, now, remember that we wanted to run on integer only um, operations. So we quantize the, the, all the weights and activations to eight bits, and we do quantization aware training basically to expose the, the entire denoiser to the um, errors induced by quantization. And we optimize over now the, the, the weights of the, of the denoiser um, over the, the pruning um, hyperparameters, as well as over the quantization hyperparameters, which are typically the, the quantization ranges or the clipping ranges. OK, um, so. Now uh, for some objective results. So here uh, I have a table comparing uh, the networks that we find with, with some of the existing sort of state-of-the-art uh, models in this space. Uh, for, for each of the columns, you see that there's colors and basically these colors represent whether or not uh, the corresponding value meets or violates the constraints that we set before. So for model size, red means that this model is too big to store on the MCU that we care about, and blue means that it, it, uh, you can store it. So uh, any row with all blue means that you can actually deploy this model. Uh, so the key is that the, the, uh, the competing approaches, one could not deploy them because they either, uh, they're either too big or produce um, uh, feature maps which are too large or they violate the latency constraint. Whereas for us, uh, with a combination of pruning and quantization, we're actually able to find models, uh, denoising algorithms or denoising neural networks, uh, which are both small enough and fast enough to, uh, to meet our constraints um, and that don't um, incur a large degradation in the denoising performance as measured by the speech to distortion ratio. Uh, so you see that the, the, in terms of speech to distortion ratio, the baseline sort of architecture that we started with um, has a 12.77 uh, dB SDR. And uh, for example, our, our, our fastest model has a 12.07 dB SDR. So there's a little bit of a drop, um, but now the question is, does that matter? Like meaning, do people actually uh, notice that difference? Do they care? And so for this, we, we ran a perceptual evaluation where we ask subjects their preference level um, uh, for, for, uh, for the output of the denoising uh, neural network compared to the uh, unprocessed uh, noisy data. Uh, 
Um, and we compared uh, the preference of users for the denoise, the denoised output produced by the baseline network, so the unpruned, unquantized network, uh, compared to the network, the networks we find. And so basically, uh, our observation is that uh, users don't prefer one over the other, meaning that the, the networks we find, which are considerably smaller and faster, are equally as good at denoising as the, as the baseline approach, which is much bigger and um, much slower. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's that concludes the, the second part about LSTMs. Um, I want to stop and see if anyone has any questions on this. No, nothing. Shall I go on? Hello, anyone there? Yeah, we are here. <laughs> so everything, everything's clear? Okay. All right, yeah. I'll move on. Okay, so for the last part of the talk, uh, I want to focus on a work we recently published at MLSYS. Uh, the title was Micronet's Neural, Arch Neural Network Architectures for Deploying Tiny ML Applications on Commodity Microcontrollers. Um, so again, the, this is kind of a similar story. The objective is to find Pareto optimal networks, uh, where Pareto is, measure, is uh, defined in the sense of latency versus accuracy. And here we targeted uh, three tiny ML perf applications. Uh, and, and we constrained ourselves to use open source standard deployment tools like TensorFlow Lite Micro. Now, in this, in this work, instead of doing a Bayesian optimization, we use a differentiable architecture search. Uh, and just a one slide kind of introduction to differentiable architecture search. So the idea is um, to replace this kind of um, combinatorial discontinuous space with, with a smooth space where each choice is, is uh, modeled as a, as, a, as a linear combination. So for example, for a given layer, I, I have here uh, X going into layer, layer one, let's say. And um, the idea is you wanna choose between two different operations to perform at layer one. Uh, so you can express the output of layer one as, as a linear combination of those options weighted by some coefficients Z1 and Z2. Uh, and basically by setting Z1 to, to one and Z2 to zero, you've selected uh, F1. Um, and you can do this at every layer. So, so basically you can have many options sort of stacked on each other. Um, and the, the benefit of this is that you have weight sharing going on between layers, uh, meaning that we don't have to train four different uh, four different networks to evaluate these, uh, these four combinations. We can just train this one network, which is twice as big, uh, but at the, at the same time, uh, the, the, the weights are shared between layers one and two, um, right? So the, these, uh, these coefficients are modeled as random variables from a multinomial distribution with parameter pi. And the, the entire goal of the optimization is basically to learn pi along with the weights that, that, that parameterize each of the functions. Uh, the key is that you can use a gradient descent to solve this problem. So you can use TensorFlow uh, running on a GPU basically to, to do this very quickly. It does require some tricks to back propagate through these, uh, through these multinomial nodes uh, because um, they're, they're, they're not uh, readily uh, differentiable uh, since, since they're categorical variables. Um, so, so we can we can pretty easily optimize closed form objectives like model size and working memory this way. Black box objectives like uh, hardware latency can be a little challenging to do this way. Um, and um, in order to get around that, we sort of studied actually the properties uh, of latency and MCUs in order to determine whether or not we can use a black box or a closed form model for for the uh, for the latency. Um, so this, 
this slide shows that uh, at the granularity of, of a single operation, the, the latency uh, the latency versus op count um, relationship varies depending on the operator. Uh, so you, you see that um, the depth-wise uh, convolutions are sort of the, the, the slowest in terms of latency for a given number of operations. Uh, but when you look at, at things on the scale of, a, of an entire, entire network, uh, then there's, there appears to be a roughly linear relationship between the number of operations that are required to do inference that on that network versus the, the latency and uh, the end-to-end -end latency. Uh, this seems to hold for a given backbone or a given problem. So it doesn't hold for, you know, if we consider the space of all possible networks, but if we restrict ourselves to a one application, uh, one search space, then, then there seems to be this kind of linear relationship. So this, this uh, figure shows, uh, this relationship for two different problems. So one, the blue is for the image backbone um, and the orange is for uh, audio backbone. And so if you look at this, basically what, what, what we concluded is that we can do a latency guided search, uh, but instead of doing a black box kind of objective, we can just use the number of operations as a, as a, uh, as a proxy for the latency. Um, and, 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 Energy seems to behave uh, to behave the same. So the the, ener the energy consumption seems to be linearly related to the number of operations uh, across different um, microcontrollers. Uh, just to give you some more information on the tiny ML perf use cases. Uh, so there there are three of them. The first one is keyword spotting. So this is a audio classification problem. Uh, basically, there is a um, 12 vocabulary words that have to be uh, recognized. Um, there's anomaly detection, which is kind of an, an industrial kind of data set where you have noises being produced by machinery and so on. And the idea is basically to classify whether or not the noise is an anomaly, like a, like a machine malfunctioning or normal, uh, normal operating behavior. Then the last uh, data set is visual wake words. And this is a, a binary image classification problem where the, the, the goal is basically just to, uh, to, to label each image as containing a person or not containing a person. Right, uh, and so here's uh, uh, some results. So starting with keyword spotting, what we have uh, in, in blue are the models that we find uh, with, with our gradient-based uh, neural architecture search approach. And you see here that our, our models uh, we find models that can that can fit on on the the range of microcontrollers we're interested in. That's that's the the vertical the vertical bars, where, which delineate basically how much flash and SRAM usage the models can have. Our models in general are are faster and more accurate than than the state of the art. So that's good. Um, same thing on visual wake words. Uh, uh, in almost all cases, we find models which are smaller faster and more accurate than, than existing approaches. Um, and same thing for anomaly detection. And yeah, that's uh, the end. Wow, perfect, three, three o'clock. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Igor, thank you very much. Yeah, so, so any questions from the audience? I think there's one question in the chat box. So any plan to apply these models to ARM, AI accelerator, things like ASOS? Mm. Um, let's see, any plans? Um, yeah, I mean, in general, we it's good if, uh, like the entire goal of all, all this model design is to sort of Show that you can you can run things on on uh, um, you, you can actually design machine learning models specifically for a particular hardware. So I I don't know about uh, Ethos in particular, but yeah, we definitely target all of our experiments to to run on ARM hardware. Um, 
Any other questions? So actually, I have a, a quick a question, um, I guess, from the previous work um, um, that you mentioned about the runtime and the latency that could be considered as a black box by just running the um, architecture that you search for um, on the device or uh, on the microcontroller. Uh, so is there any like direct relationship between the size of the model or a particular architecture configuration parameters and the runtime or the best estimate for runtime is really to run the model on the device or the processor? Um, well, this, this plot is showing that the number of operations tells you basically how, how, how slow it will be, right? That's right. So what is that? Is your question? Oh, I see. Um, so essentially, look, the, the, you can get a very good estimate of the runtime by just having um, the model architecture without the need to run the yeah. model on the controller. Yes, exactly. Because the alternative is the alternative is either to run it, run the model on the device mm -hmm. um, directly, and that that is challenging because it, it can be slow. You know, right. de deploying these models like within within your optimization loop can be slow. Number one. Um, you could do something like um, like like a reinforce, where um, uh, you you could actually back propagate uh, through through a black box function. Yes, you know, like yeah. you, it, it would it would be slow basically. But if you had to if you had to um, deploy every single model, the the alternative to that is to basically build uh, a functional approximation. Yes, to the latency as a function of of your configuration. And, and there's lots of research papers about that. Um, but what we found actually is it's not necessary because there's a, we have a, a good enough proxy here in terms of operations. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, there's another question in the chat box. So you can check that. So only used ARM integral instructions. What about some ARM, some ARM extensions like SIMD instructions to accelerate or does the model need ARM floating point instruction set by default? Um, I am not really sure what, how to answer that question. <laughs> I, I wasn't um, the one that deployed the, um, I, I think this is, a, this, is, this is for the LSTM work. Uh, so I wasn't the one that, that did that, that de like the deployment part of that. Um, so if you email me this, uh, the question, I can forward it to the person that did that and get back to you. Yeah, yes, and I remember that also saw some of the, the, the technical news. I remember, so right now the ARM is also collaborating like with the Google for the TensorFlow Lite to, to design some of the specialized instruction that to do. Hmm. Uh, Target for the TensorFlow Lite for those the deep learning workload. I remember. Mm. And um, any other questions? Okay, so actually, so I have some other questions. <laughs> yeah, and the first, so so in your first part of your talk and your third part of your talk, so you introduced the two different ways for the network search. Yep. Actual search, right? So I was wondering, so can these two be combined together? Because I remember for the Gaussian process, I, in the general machine learning community, I remember there are some prior, prior papers in like SML they discuss that the 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 to to apply the to, to combine the the deep architecture with the, the Gaussian process together to make it a differentiable and so on. So I'm I was wondering, so since you're certain is also a differentiable-ness, whether it can be combined with the, the Gaussian process-based um, nest together to gain some actual performance improvement. Yeah, so I think you, you can combine the, the approaches. Um, there's actually, I read a paper recently that, that was doing that. So mm -hmm. the, like the benefit of the differentiable search is the weight sharing. That's, yeah. the, that's the big thing because you don't have to train um, you know, every combination of options basically separately, they can all be trained together. 
Uh, so you can actually take that and you can you can combine it with the the Bayesian optimization uh, formalism, which is good because that 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 gives you a non-parametric model of the objective yeah. you care about, right? And you don't have to worry about the back propagation and all that stuff. Yeah. But actually, yeah. Um, there was a paper I, I think at NeurIPS this year. I think it was called B O N A S. Um, you can search for it, and uh, I think they were doing that. Okay, that's wonderful. And uh, I have another question. So, so right now, so uh, in your opinion, so what is the the emerging challenge? So, because you and many other researchers work so right now, so the, the deploy the, the deep learning model on the tiny MCU. So right now, have already been a lot of progress. So, in your opinion, so what is the, the emerging the next phase challenge? And uh, what is the, the, because we know that uh, as long as we have the challenge and then we have the demand and then we, we have the, the motivation. Mm -hmm. So for example, so right now, so in this year, Neuro IPS and uh, some other conference, so we have some, see some papers and uh, for the on-device training, right? Mm -hmm. so this kind will become the, the deploy paradigm in the, in those the, the micro MCU, the micro IoT, or it is just kind of the, what we fabric with that kind of the, the demand that so the academic community just just propose yeah, yeah right right yeah that's a great question um well i i don't think that even this stuff is really a solved problem um mm -hmm. there's still lots of open open questions like in, in practice this is this is extremely underexplored i, I like I, I don't think like the um I, I don't think that there are so many like open source tools that do this, that, you know, everybody that needs to solve this problem can basically solve it easily. So I, I think there's, there's still a lot, a lot to go in terms of like the, the tools that are available to developers um, and, and, and that kind of thing, as well as the deployment tools. So one, some of the things that we've learned along the way is that not every possible like thing you can think of, not every possible optimization you can actually deploy to a device because you need a deployment tool which sits between your TensorFlow or PyTorch and your device, right? Which you know uh, somehow maps your TensorFlow graph into code that can actually run on a device. So those tools are still kind of like very early and they're being developed. One of them is the TensorFlow Lite Micro. Um, so that's from Google. Uh, and uh, you know that has limited support for certain things. So I think there's, Lots of lots of uh, you know growth that can happen there, um, but in terms of research, uh, let's see. Yeah, it's hard to say. I don't know. <laughs> I, I do I do agree that lots of people are looking at the the federated learning uh, stuff, and I, actually our group has done has done work in that as well. So so what I mean that is a federated learning is a very kind of the strong deploy scenario for the for the IoT. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have any experience with that. It's hard. To, it's really hard to say for me. There's lots of challenges, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, and also it is involved with the privacy and the security issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like the you know the the comparison, like what is the like the baseline in that case? Um, like yeah, basically right. showing that your approach is better than the baseline can be quite challenging. <laughs> But yeah, like I said, I don't, I don't have any experience with that. We, we did have a paper at ICLR this year, which was uh, doing um, uh, federated learning. I saw uh, one of my group group members was working on that. Okay. So, so how about if we even don't consider about the federal learning? How about just the local update, the on device learning, on device like personalization? Yeah. Yeah. So. So do you think it is kind of, uh, you have the strong motivations or, so from, especially from the perspective of the industry? Mm. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, again, I don't know. <laughs> I have the same questions to be honest. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think the, the, like it definitely sounds like a good idea, but then the question is, is it better than like the, the baseline? Right, like, is it better than just sending your data somewhere, and and then like receiving receiving an update like you know once a day or something from from a server? 
I don't know. Yeah. I actually don't know myself. <laughs> But but I but I think that so if this demand become very strong, I think that will be good news for the market. But that means that we require the more powerful MCU. <laughs> right, right. You would require like a hardware that can do training very efficiently. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. Okay. So any other questions from the audience? Okay, so if no more questions, so let's thank you again. It was a very exciting talk. So yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. So we should have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Yeah, me too. Thank you everyone for attending our talk. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs>